You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. We begin this week with Shuttle Manifest Destiny and the movable feast that the last days of STS launching has become. It now appears the next shuttle flight, Discovery Flying STS-133, will launch on October 29th. And the STS-134 flight of Endeavour moves to February 28th of next year. An official announcement is expected on July 1st. The reason for the delay? Scientists need some time to put the finishing touches on the final shuttle payload to the station, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a particle physics experiment. But we use the word final with some caution, as NASA has not ruled out an Encore mission for Atlantis. Look for a decision on that one in August. Of course, there are a lot of people out there who would like to see the shuttles fly on. A new and familiar name is now on that list. Senator John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, a bona fide hero, and a shuttle veteran as well, released a statement on Obama's plans for NASA this week. He repeated what he has often said, that the shuttle should stay just a little bit longer. He does support keeping the station going past 2015, and he agrees a moon base is not in the cards now. As for the smaller, less experienced companies vying to fly cargo and eventually people to the space station, he says they should only be phased in after they demonstrate a high degree of competency and reliability, particularly with regard to safety concerns. In Hawthorne, California, at SpaceX headquarters, they would beg to differ, with all due respect to the senator. It's been a few weeks now since their successful first launch of their Falcon 9 rocket, and they're still pouring through the data, trying to better understand why they had a late-in-the-count scrub before the launch, why the second stage rolled in orbit, and why they were unable to recover the first stage. Details on all that and much more are in the full interview I had via Skype with SpaceX's Ken Bowersox the other day. At the end of the program, we'll give you a link to watch it all. Here's a little sample of what Sox told me. Let's talk about you. Would you, would you strap yourself to a Falcon 9? Well, uh, not yet. The, the, the first Falcon 9, uh, th that was a, a test rocket, um, and there, there's a lot of improvements we want to make before we put people on the rockets. We'll be looking at a Block 2 version of our Falcon 9 uh, before we'd be ready to, to fly crews on board a Dragon. Um, the, the Block 2 would have upgraded engines. It'll have uh, improved engine-out capability and um, uh, improved avionics redundancy eventually. But you will be. You will be the first to fly, you think? Uh, you know, Elon has to decide that, uh, the founder of our company. Now, nobody's been designated to fly, but I'd love to. I suspect you'll be. I call yeah. here and he keeps smiling. You know, he, he's not committing to anything yet. Well, he might want to go with you. Let's, uh, uh, a final thought here. Uh, you know, you, you've sat on both sides, if you will, of the, of the space business as a, as a NASA astronaut and now on the uh, commercial crew side of things, if you will. Uh, see, you've seen... And you've got this whole debate over what's going to happen in space next is really becoming extremely poisonous. I'm curious if you have some thoughts, if, if you've thought of a way there can be a middle ground uh, to, to get this out of this um, more heat than light uh, poisonous debate. Uh, yeah, well, at first, I just want to agree with you. I think uh, fighting is uh, over, over what path we should take forward uh, with space exploration is not helping us right now. We need to uh, work together to find a middle ground uh, and, and move forward. Um, what I would like to see is uh, a place for commercial operators like SpaceX to, uh, to participate uh, in exploration, uh, which I, I think will be part of any plan forward. Um, and I'd also like to see that the folks at NASA and, uh, and, and other contractor organizations out there, uh, you know, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, I'd like to see them be able to use some of the methods that, that we use at SpaceX. Uh, I'd like to see folks be dedicated to, to lowering costs and, uh, and improving access into orbit. Uh, I think if we can uh, have that sort of focus in any program forward, I think it's going to be good for all of us. And, and, and that's why I'm at SpaceX is whether we're successful or not, I, I hope we're putting pressure on the rest of the team uh, out there, the rest of the big, the big exploration team uh, to be more cost effective uh, in everything they try to do. All right, I think you've succeeded on that front for sure. Ken Bowersox with SpaceX, thanks for your time. All right, Miles, great talking with you. Again, we'll have a link to the full eight-minute interview with Sox for you at the end of the program, so stay tuned for that.
Some fire and smoke from an Ariane 5 rocket. It blasted off from Guyana. The payload, two satellites. Arabsat 5A will provide telecom and broadband services to Africa and the Middle East. The South Korean COM satellite includes weather observation, ocean surveillance, and telecom payloads. All eyes will be on Ariane Space later this year as they begin launch operations using the Soyuz and new Vega rockets. The Japanese space agency JAXA is on a roll these days. We've showed you these pictures before, but we'll show you again because they're just so darn cool. This is the Hayabusa sample return capsule streaking across the sky, returning dust samples from an asteroid. Now check this out. It's a solar sail called Icaros that launched last month. This shot was taken after it unfurled on June 15th when it was more than 5 million miles from Earth. Solar sail lovers say they are a great propulsion technology. The idea? The sail will be pushed through the void by the sun's light, specifically the photons. Ironically, solar sails do not rely on the solar wind, which is not as strong as the photons. Guess you could call it a new tack in space. We'll keep you posted on how the space regatta is going. If you want a good view of what is going on in the world of space, check out the daily CS Extra from the Coalition for Space Exploration, which is where we saw this next story. The Cassini spacecraft made its closest flyby ever past Saturn's moon Titan last weekend, skimming just 547 miles over Titan's clouds, looking for evidence of a possible magnetic field. This was some fancy flying. The spacecraft actually dipped low enough to enter Titan's atmosphere, which has a totally different aerodynamic environment than space. This was Cassini's 71st flyby of Titan, and it was the first Cassini flyby brought to you by CS Extra. To find out more about the Coalition for Space Exploration and to subscribe to the daily CS Extra, visit www.spacecoalition.com. A spectacular new image is out this week from the Hubble Space Telescope of a fertile star-forming region in a galaxy next door. The glowing bubble of gas is in the nearby Large Magellanic Cloud called N11. It is nearly a thousand light years across. Think of it as a stellar nursery. The sparkling diamond-like clusters are energetic star formation. Astronomers study these star clusters for clues as to how stars are born and develop. Astronomers have detected a superstorm on an extrasolar planet. The world in question is a so-called hot Jupiter planet light years away in the constellation Pegasus. It orbits very close to its sun, and one side always faces inward, and so it is scorching hot. The other side, outward, very cold. The planet also has a thick carbon monoxide atmosphere. Now, we all know what happens on this planet when hot air meets cold. We get storms. And that's what they're finding on that planet, too. Storms with winds up to 6,000 miles per hour. That's about category 25 on the Saffir-Simpson scale, I believe. And here's a little news about the planet Mercury. The International Astronomical Union has approved a name for this double ring basin imaged by the MESSENGER spacecraft. It's called Rachmaninoff. The IAU names craters on Mercury after deceased artists, musicians, painters, and authors. Here's something to make a mother proud. Seventh graders at the Evergreen Middle School in Cottonwood, California, discovered a cave that had never been seen before on the planet Mars. It's all part of the imaging project offered by NASA and Arizona State. The kids directed the Mars Odyssey orbiter to take some snaps of a Martian volcano called Pavonis Mons. Similar features have been seen elsewhere on the red planet, but never on this volcano. Next up, the students have submitted the site as a candidate for imaging by the Super High Res High Rise Camera on the Mars Recon Orbiter. With a resolution of about a foot per pixel, High Rise could actually see inside the cave. Their teacher, Dennis Mitchell, gets an attaboy as well. And finally, let's check in with our Mars 500 friends. That's three Russians, two Europeans, and one Chinese guy who are sealed up inside a mock spacecraft in Moscow on a simulated mission to Mars. The idea is to mimic as closely as possible the conditions of a real interplanetary mission. They are taking or growing all of their own food. Outside communication is limited and patchy, et cetera, et cetera. Does this sound kind of like a spacey version of that whole Biosphere 2 thing to you? Well, it does to me. Anyway, they'll be filing regular video diaries during their mission. So let's see what's up. So here you have the greenhouse. And here, 
So again with some flowers and soon with some vegetables and uh, a lot of plants that we will grow and um, eat. But only after Mars, after we landed on Mars, we'll use this greenhouse. But we also have the storage module with a lot of food because 520 days it's a, a lot of things to eat, a lot of feature devices. For the record, the facility consists of four interconnected modules and a fifth external module that will simulate the Martian surface once they get there. Total volume of the living space, 550 cubic meters. The mission will run for 520 days and conclude November 5th, 2011. It'll be interesting to see if the crew is still jazzed about doing these video diaries come, say, next August. Might get old soon. Actually, a lot of things might get old soon. We'll check in with them from time to time to see how deep space is treating them, and we'll make sure they don't order up a pizza delivery. They might have time to watch more, but the rest of us, well, we gotta go. Thanks for watching, and thanks to our sponsors, Binary Space and the Coalition for Space Exploration. We really appreciate the support. Oh, speaking of support, check out our page at spaceflightnow.com slash twist. There's a painless way to help us out with twists, and we would love for you to do that. Send us your complaints or compliments to twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us at This Week in Space. Check out the blog, milesobrien.com. Next week, the Russians and the Europeans are cooking up a partnership to protect the Earth from killer asteroids, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. The latest from the Chicken Little Desk, next time on This Week in Space. Oh, and before we go, Here's the link to that video that has the full interview with SpaceX's Ken Bowersox. We asked him what went right, what went wrong, and what the team is working on now before they try again. Check it out.